It's that time of year, December, holiday celebrations, family time. Are you going home for the holiday? Don't you get asked that a lot? Well, I used to dread that question when I was single in New York and had to work through most major holidays in the TV newsroom. I would feel homesick or sorry for myself or guilty that I couldn't visit my family. December strikes me as a season of longing. It's an emotionally charged season that tends to make us feel moody, hopeful, or regretful, especially if you, just like I once was, are on your own. You become ultra-sensitive and deeply aware of why you've chosen to live a different life from the loved ones you've left behind. You may also wonder where you belong. Whether or not you can go home this holiday season, I hope you can feel right at home here with our podcast. Throughout this month, we'll be featuring young Chinese who have traveled to a new world to pursue their dreams. They'll be narrating their personal blogs about growing up and adapting to a new sense of identity, or adjusting to a new environment and discovering what makes them miss home. I'm Mabel Chan, and this is a special holiday edition of One in a Billion, a podcast about China through the voices of Chinese millennials in America. In this episode, we'll listen to Shelley and Sarah Zhou, who grew up in Indiana as Chinese Americans. Surrounded by white people, how did they develop a sense of belonging? How do they see race as multiracial kids? Here's their story. Hi, it's Sarah and Shelley. We'll both be reading the blog today, and to you, it might sound like one person, but we're actually both doing this. We are, in fact, twins. No one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin, or his background, or his religion. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. A quote from Nelson Mandela. We attended a panel discussion about growing up in a multiracial household, where panelists discussed their life experiences being a multiracial person. Our mom is 100% Caucasian, and our dad is 100% Chinese. They met through work on the West Coast and raised us and our siblings in the Midwest. We are multiracial, mixed, biracial, half, whatever you call it. We are that. It was wonderful to hear from other mixed people because we were not exposed to that in our childhood. But I realized even among mixed people, we have differing views on our race and what it means. Growing up in a small town in Indiana, the other biracial people that we knew were our sisters and brother. When we traveled to China to visit our grandparents, we would stare at the elder mixed kids we saw while waiting in line at the customs. My siblings and I would grab each other and say, "Look, look, they're just like us," and we literally stare. When you're multiracial, seeing another multiracial person causes a layered reaction. First, it's strange, but extremely familiar. At the exact same time, their physical makeup is strange because it's different. I would imagine that my initial reaction is what other people think when they see me. Your brain tries to categorize them, but since I look at my face in the mirror every day, their look is also so so familiar. Then I always remember thinking, they're just like me. The zoo kids aren't alone. We're not the only ones. Of course, we didn't think we were the only ones, but when you don't see it regularly, you have a huge sense of belonging when you do. Our parents did a wonderful job raising us to truly embrace both of our races and cultural backgrounds. Not having other mixed kids around did not leave us feeling outcast or like we didn't belong. Race rarely crossed our minds. Now I realize how lucky we were to never experience a terribly negative response to our genetic makeup. That must be from the effects of a small town. Even though it's quite conservative and traditional, we found that in our town there's a sense of camaraderie. When we left the Midwest, we met so many more people and have friends now that are mixed, just like us. And I still get excited when I see those people. It is more than just the fact that we look similar or have similar multiracial issues, like what is my skin tone? My cheeks burn in the sun, but the rest of me gets golden brown. Which box do I check? My hair is not black; it's just dark brown. 
I found that we love meeting those people because they are the result of an interracial relationship. Most likely, their parents suffered challenges and hardships for being together. I'm so happy to see interracial couples because I know their children will be just like us. No matter the racial equation, white and Asian, black and white, Hispanic and black, we are all mixed. We are our own race of multiple races. And it is so incredibly cool to see two people come together in love and defy the stereotypes. They love each other for each other. There is no color. Growing up, our parents never made us decide which race we would identify with. On the panel we attended, the panelists talked about when they decided and how they identified with one race or another. It was a surprise to me that they chose. For example, they talked about which box they checked. Their parents had a reasoning to choose one or the other. My mom told me to check white and Asian, and if I couldn't choose two, check other. And if there was no other, leave it blank. It wasn't weird. I didn't question it. We were both. Hearing from this panel showed me that other multiracial people have had different experiences that led them to have to decide or have to identify with one or another. I didn't know I had to choose, so I never did, and now it's too late to decide anyway. I grew up thinking hybrid kids were going to be the future race, and I still think that is true. Mixed people already exist. My hope is that as time goes on, society will put less pressure on people to define their race. What are you will no longer be the conversation starter. Who cares what you are? Ask me something about me. Ask me what my opinion is on a topic. Ask me what I like to do in my free time. Ask me what my dreams are. Ask me about something I choose to believe, not something that I am. The more we define and separate, the further we will be from joining together as human beings, no longer divided by race. It is optimistic, but we have to strive for erasing all racism. It may never happen in my lifetime or the next. But if we don't aim for that, we won't get close. Even though we don't know the people on the panel, we gained a little bit more insight on their background. We were shielded from the harsh reality of racism, and we're grateful for that. But it did make me a little sad to hear they only chose one race to identify with. Why choose? As human beings, we want everything. We always want more. Why not be both or all? This discussion made me realize even they, the multiracial, biracial, mixed kids, are not immune to the standards of society and lose sight of their own uniqueness because other people can't find the category they belong in. It's cliched and overused, but who cares what other people think? Instead, we choose to make our own category and fully embrace our multiracial makeup. Thanks for letting us share our perspective. Thank Thank you. you. That was Shelly and Sarah Zoe reading their blog, first published on a website earlier this year. Both are now pursuing a master's degree at Harvard. Previously, they were working for C-SPAN in Washington, D.C. Our next story is about warm water. I bet there's no place in the world that would readily serve you warm water in the restaurant, except China. Zara Zhang, also a student at Harvard, brings us her longing for warm water during her freshman year in college. Why does that matter to her sense of belonging? And who is it that first made her feel out of place? Let's listen to Zara narrating her blog, which first appeared last spring on her website. I still remember the day when I realized the concept of warm water does not exist in America. On a brisk winter morning my freshman year, I stepped into Obon Pan and asked if I could have a cup of warm water. The waitress looked at me as if I had said those words in Chinese. Warm water? She said with a frown, as if combining these two words into a phrase was an idea so ludicrous that she had never thought of it before. I can give you a cup of hot water if you want. We have ice water too, she tried. I shook my head. I wanted warm water, I explained. Neither too hot nor too cold. 
I suggested that she mix some cold and hot water for me. She nodded, still in disbelief of my request. Then she proceeded to fill a glass with ice and poured hot water into it. By the time I received the cup, the water was already cold and felt no different from tap water. And I was informed that I needed to pay two dollar for the cup. Growing up, I had often been told by my mother that you should always drink warm water first thing in the morning. As a child, I never questioned it and was served a cup of warm water every morning before I was given my breakfast. Only after I came to America did I realize that I should never have taken that daily cup of warm water for granted. In every restaurant I have been to in this country, whether it serves Western or Asian food, I am handed a huge glass of iced water before anything else. There are few things that turn me off more than the sight of ice cubes floating in my water. Drinking iced water makes my stomach churn, especially in the morning. Maybe my mother's training has altered my constitution such that my body can no longer deal with water below a certain temperature. Inevitably, I asked the waiter to replace my water with water without ice. I have long ago given up on asking for warm water. After I have related my warm water struggles to my friends, I have come to realize that asking for iceless water is actually an Asian thing to do. Apparently, only Asians like me find chilled water distasteful. On the one hand, I was happy to find that I was not the only one who hated iced water. On the other hand, I was surprised that there was a cultural and even racial dimension to a question as innocuous as water preference. When I mentioned to my American friend that Chinese people often heat their milk before drinking it, he cringed in disgust. Then I asked him what explains Americans' fascination with iced water. He said, "Cold water is refreshing." Lukewarm water gives the feeling that it has been sitting in the room for a long time. It's like the feeling when you sit on a chair and realize that it's still warm from the butt of the last person who sat on it. It made a little sense to me, but I was not convinced. Warm water can be fresh too, if only Americans knew how to mix it properly. It is no accident that the West prefers cold and the East prefers hot. Chinese medicine comes in the form of hot concoctions, Western medicine in pills. Refrigeration was first invented in the West in the 19th century, and arrived in China much later. This is a testimony to how our eating habits are deeply ingrained in our cultural backgrounds. No one is born with a preference to hot or cold drinks, but in the case of ice water, America is actually the exception, not the norm. In most of Asia and even Europe. Restaurants serve room temperature water. In China, you may expect hot tea or freshly boiled water. I have found Harvard's dining options to be very Western-centric. If we want hot food for breakfast, simple things like scrambled eggs and sausages, we have to trek all the way to the freshman dining hall Annenberg, and we're presented with the impossible choice between food and sleep. The lack of hot breakfast in the houses' dining halls. Has been particularly frustrating for me and other international students from China. We were brought up on the mantra that one must eat hot food for breakfast, and Chinese people do not generally regard cereal and sandwiches as real food. One Harvard University Dining Services administrator has once replied to my complaints by essentially saying, "But we have oatmeal. American oatmeal is so tasteless compared to the porridge that I grew up eating." That I felt like consuming it resulted in negative utility for me. On the other hand, I realized that people like me form a minority on Harvard's campus. Most American students may be fine with bagels and slices of ham and cheese for breakfast. It is at moments like this that I resign to the fact that I'm in America, not China. That a foreigner should be grateful and happy with what she has, and stop expecting the host country to be a replication of home. I remind myself that I'm lucky to be in the land of dreams, opportunities, and ice water. That was Zara Zhang, a rising senior, setting her sights on the Silicon Valley after graduating from Harvard next May. In our next episode, we'll listen to two young Chinese women sharing their stories about their mother and father, when each of them is thousands of miles away from home. 
We want to include you in our conversation and our reflections. Pitch me a story or send me your comments. Just go to our Facebook page or website at chinapersonified.com. Pitch a story or email me an audio story maximum five minutes at info at chinapersonified.com. I'm Mabel Chan. This has been a special holiday edition of One in a Billion.